Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for Education in Action. I hope that the video that we just showed gave you uh, a little indication of some of the innovation and the exciting things that are happening in the College of Education here at the University of South Florida as we work together to shape the future of education in our state. For those of you that have not met me or that I have yet to meet, my name is Rob Knopel and it's my great honor to serve as the Dean of the College of Education at USF. I want to extend a warm welcome to everyone that has come to join us today. Thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be with us. I really believe that today will be an exciting opportunity for us to engage around some important issues in education here, certainly in Hillsborough County, the Tampa Bay region, and in our state. So we are glad to have representatives from the entire Tampa Bay region here to talk about issues that are near and dear to our hearts. Today is also a day for us to highlight the partnerships that we have here in the College of Education, the partnerships we create and maintain by coming together for events like this serve to enhance the quality of education throughout the state of Florida and help to create more opportunities for the students that we serve. Before we start the program, I ask that everyone please rise and direct your attention to the stage for the presentation of colors for today's event. The colors are presented by the University of South Florida Police Department Honor Guard, and I ask that you please remain standing until the colors have been retired so that our special guests now joining me on the stage from the VP VPK class at the Village Early Learning Center in Brandon can lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. You know, I've worked in public education for 28 years and I still love hearing children saying it's just the, it's the greatest sound in the world. And it's also nice to know that I can be upstaged by three and four year olds, so. <laughs> anyway, thank you, thank you everyone. Please be seated. Thank you to students and thank you to the University Police Honor Guard for your presentation. The mission of the College of Education at the University of South Florida is to transform education. 
so that we can improve outcomes for students and the communities that we serve. We achieve our mission by hosting events like Education in Action, which brings us together to examine current issues in education and to share how we're addressing those issues here in the college. Today we're here to explore the state of the teaching profession within Florida public schools and to introduce some of the innovative solutions and programs that the USF College of Education is launching in order to prepare the next generation of educators. Many of our graduates, and we have a, a lot of students in the room, many of our graduates will go on to serve as teachers, administrators, counselors, school psychologists, and advocates in our communities. Therefore, I find it critically important that the College of Education properly prepare future educators to understand how to address the challenges and the obstacles that we face within, within education institutions and organizations. Today is a really wonderful opportunity for us to come together um, to share our perspectives and the challenges that we face and the successes that we have in meeting those challenges. I want to take a moment to introduce some important people that are in the room with us. Um, and to recognize their contributions to the college and our community. And I want to start with the administration in the College of Education. With us today is Dr. Kathy Bradley Klug. She's the Associate Dean for Research, Innovation, and Faculty Affairs. Kathy. There she is, she's waving. Dr. Ann Cranston Jingris. She's the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the College of Education and the Director of the Center for Migrant Education at USF. <laughs> Dr. Brenda Walker, the Associate Dean of the University of South Florida at St. Petersburg College of Education. Dr. Connie Hines, the Interim Director for the David C. Anshin Center for the Advancement of Teaching. <laughs> Dr. Dick Puglisi, Director of the Gus Stavros Center for Free Enterprise and Economic Education. Dr. James Welsh, the Director of the Florida Center for Instructional Technology. I also want to recognize the department chairs in the College of Education. With us is Dr. Deanna Michael. Dr. Elizabeth Shaughnessy Dedrick. Dr. Barbara Shercliffe. Dr. Judith Ponicell. And lastly, a newly created office that we're going to talk about in a bit. Today's program is Dr. Laura Sabella, who is the Director of Field and Clinical Education in the College of Education. I also want to thank the faculty and staff of the College of Education that are here today. Could you please stand and be recognized? Thank you most earnestly for your service to our students and our programs. Lastly, I want to recognize colleagues from the USF system that are with us today. Today joining us is Dr. Dwayne Smith, Senior Vice Provost and Dean of the Office of Graduate Studies. Dr. Roger Brinley, the Vice President for USF World and a member of the faculty in the College of Education. Please join me in thanking the USF ambassadors who greeted you and for helping set up tonight's event. We appreciate your efforts. I want to take a moment to acknowledge our school district partners who are with us today. These partners have graciously volunteered to serve their time to make today a success, and they actually were instrumental in planning today's events. I want to introduce USF alum and Superintendent of Pasco County Schools, Mr. Kurt Browning. <laughs> Superintendent of Hillsborough County Public Schools, Mr. Jeff Akins. <laughs> Mr. 
and another USF alum, the superintendent of Pinellas County Schools, Mr. Mike Grego. With us today, we have some other special guests. Hillsborough County School Board member, member Linda Gray, I believe, is in the audience. And Sarasota County School Board member Caroline Zucker. I also want to take a minute to thank the Florida State Fair Authority, led by Cheryl Flood and her staff, Terry Longfee, Dave Redman, and Michael Rogers for making today's event possible. The Florida State Fair Authority provides this wonderful space for us and the food for our event as premier sponsors for Education in Action. They're an invaluable partner to the College of Education and, as I said, the premier sponsor for today's event. So thank you to the Florida State Fair Authority. And now please join me in welcoming Cheryl Flood, Executive Director of the Florida State Fair Authority, to the stage. Good afternoon. My name is Cheryl Flood. I'm the Executive Director here at the Florida State Fair. I just want to thank you so much and welcome you today to the Florida State Fairgrounds. Um, this luncheon, I know, I don't know the com full complete history, but our former chairman, uh, George Steinbrenner, uh, many years ago, had a passion for education. And then many of you know, um, knew Olin Mont as well. And for many years, our board has had a passion and, and dedication to education. It's part of our mission here at the Florida State Fair. So we're honored today to host this luncheon. So thank you so much. Um, one other issue, a lot of people don't know what the Florida State Fair is. So a little bit about us. We're a quasi-governmental entity under Commissioner Free jurisdiction under the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. We're a privately funded entity, so we year-round host events. Today, you might notice some of the uh, sheriff's officers' uh, cars. They're doing a drill on the grounds today. So at any given time, we can have three to four events on the weekend, sometimes up to five to six events through our non-fair business. So if you know anyone in the market looking for um, a place to host their facility, we're open for business. Um, last but not least, we are gearing up. This luncheon always is uh, a big part of us starting our 78 days to the fair. Uh, so uh, this year's theme is Spark a Tradition. So we invite you out, you, you and your families out, to come to our huge Super Bowl that we have in February, which is our 12 days of fun. Um, it'll be February 6th through the 17th this year. So we invite you to come out and have a good time and spark a tradition with your family as well. Thank you so much for allowing the Fair Authority to be a part of this great luncheon. It's our, our honor to host it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Cheryl. We are incredibly grateful for your long-term partnership and your support of the College of Education. Now, it's my great honor to introduce you to our keynote speaker for today's event. We're grateful to host a very special guest from the Florida Department of Education, Dr. Paul Burns. Dr. Burns earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Arkansas and his doctorate in education from St. Louis University, where his research focused on teacher turnover in the state of Florida. He served in numerous school leadership capacities for the state of Missouri before moving to Florida in 2014 to take leadership role with the Sarasota County Schools. In January of 2018, following his work in Sarasota, Dr. Burns joined the Florida Department of Education, where he currently serves as Deputy Chancellor for Educator Quality. In his current role, Dr. Burns oversees the Bureau of Educator Certification, Recruitment, Development, and Retention. And if that's not enough, Standards and Instructional Support, the Just Read Florida Office, and the Bureau for Professional Practice Services. Dr. Burns is dedicated to improving student learning by ensuring that every Florida teacher and leader is well prepared, developed, supported, and supervised by educators who strive to enhance and improve the teaching profession. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Dr. Paul Burns.
Welcome, sir. Thank you, Dr. Canopel, for um, that nice, warm welcome. It's certainly a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I can tell you that Dr. Canopel and I certainly had several conversations as we were preparing for today's event. Um, I, in my role, am asked to speak at various events. And so I always want, as I prepare, I want to think about how I make my time meaningful and impactful for you. But I, I must admit that when Dr. Canopel started, and he started reading that bio, I thought to myself, I forgot to tell him don't read that bio. <laughs> as much prep work as we spent on the phone, I always cringe a little bit when I hear uh, that bio and I sit there thinking, who are they talking about when they are reading that thing? So um, certainly thank you for allowing me to be here. Any time that I can talk about teaching and learning, uh, the themes that you have for today's event of education in action, transforming education. Anytime I have a chance to be with the group and talk about those very important topics is certainly a special day for me. I just shared with you that Dr. Canopel and I spent some time on the phone uh, really talking about and planning this event. And so really I started with one simple question when Dr. Canopel and I were, were, were talking. And that question I said, who's going to be there? What do you want me to talk about? Right? I get asked to speak at a lot of events. I said, what do you want me to talk about? And a part of the reason, again, I ask that question is because for you, I want this to be impactful. I want it to be meaningful. And we kept coming back to those two very things of action, education in action, and then also the notion of transforming education. Dr. Canopel just shared a little bit with you about my role as Deputy Chancellor of Educator Quality. What I found in this role is that people were very familiar with my work in a school when I was a teacher, when I was a school leader, when I was the district. People had a sense of the work that I was engaged in. But as Deputy Chancellor, most folks often ask me a very simple question. What is that? Many times it's students that ask that question. So Dr. Canopo just gave you an overview of the teams that I have a chance to work with at the department. And I feel uh, very lucky and humble to be able to work with teams across the state of Florida who are really committed deeply to changing teaching and learning. So what you'll see on the screen before you are just some of the bureaus at the department. We are one department. We're divided into vi divisions. And then those divisions are divided into bureaus. So the first bureau I have a chance to work with is the Bureau of Educator Recruitment, Development, and Retention. I've been pushing my team because I, this bureau is really misnamed. Um, and I will tell you, just like in education, if you're familiar, we often like to use a lot of acronyms in education. And so um, we call this one BIRDER. There's an R, a D, and an R, BIRDER is what we call it. And I've told my team there's a P missing from that and another R. This team does work with recruitment, professional learning, development of teachers, but they also lead our state recognition programs. We recognize teachers and leaders and school-related employees across the state. And they also work with all of our teacher preparation programs programs at colleges and universities, and also all of our leadership or principal preparation programs at colleges and universities. The second bureau that you see is the Bureau of Educator Certification. All of the certificates for the state of Florida are processed through that office. And for those of you that are students that are sitting in the, the audience and, and those of you that are district folks, you may remember when I came on board a year and a half or so ago, there was this little thing called a backlog of uh, teacher certification, and so uh, that team works very hard, has worked really hard to get caught up um, on processing all certificates across the state of Florida. The third bureau is the Office of Professional Practices Services. You know, it's a humbling day when you're a leader and you have team members that come to you, and the team leaders of the Office of Professional Practices Services, they showed up in my office one day, and I thought, oh boy, I'm, this, this is not going to go well. I know this is not going to go well. And they looked and they said, Paul, we think we need to have a talk with you. And I said, great, I'm all about feedback. Give me this feedback. I want to know what you're thinking. What's on your mind as a new leader? And they said, well, we, we, we don't think that you talk about us enough. And I said, great. They said, are you ashamed of us? 
And I said, absolutely not. Um, this office, I will say, they gave me some good feedback. I, I did tend to shy away from talking about them a little bit, but what I realized is, is we think about the importance of having the right teacher in a classroom, we think about the importance of having the right leader in the classroom, their work is very important. The Office of Professional Practices Services, that is the office that investigates allegations of misconduct against certified educators. Now, I don't want to scare you, I am not telling you we have bad teachers and principals in our schools. Um, but we also know that each and every day, if you look at the paper, there is a reality that we have some teachers and leaders that make some choices that are not appropriate. And so my challenge to those district leaders that are sitting in the, in the audience for our college, university folks, as you're thinking about teacher preparation, principal preparation, for the teachers that are sitting there, for you parents that are out there, here's my challenge. Um, I want you to think, and, and we really need to continue to talk about how we help our teachers and leaders really understand the importance of good decision making and ethical decision making. And so it's an office that investigates those allegations. Uh, two new bureaus have recently uh, joined Educator Quality, and I'm absolutely thrilled about that because it really allows us to break down some silos and to work very collaboratively together. You will see those two bureaus on the bottom. The first is the Just Read Florida office. Uh, the Just Read Florida office at the Department of Education um, deals deeply with literacy and thinking about policy. Um, if you are following the news and you have followed our the release of the NAEP scores recently in Florida, you did see, we did see a little bit of stagnation, maybe some declines in Florida. Um, if you look at the percent proficient for students in Florida on third grade reading, you need only look at those scores to know this is a very important office as we think deeply about literacy, literacy instruction. Um, I've heard the commissioner, um, since he's been on board, say a, a phrase that I like to use, and the commissioner of education says, if we can get all of our kids reading on grade level by third grade, the rest of the problems would solve themselves. The rest would solve themselves. So uh, Just Read Florida office, a very important office has joined educator quality as we think about literacy. And the Bureau of Standards and Instructional Support is new to educator quality. You may be following that we voted a while ago and we have a new governor. You may be aware of that. We have a new commissioner. And so with um, the, the new governor with Governor DeSantis, uh, Executive Order 1932, if you're following in education, um, he put out an executive order that said that we needed to rid our standards of Common Core. And so the Bureau of Standards and Instructional Support is really that team that's leading all of that work as we think about our standards. Now you'll see one special box on the screen uh, that's not highlighted in blue. Um, and that group is not technically part of the department. They're not technically an educator quality, but I do like to talk about their work. Um, I serve as the department liaison for the Education Practices Commission. Um, the Education Practices Commission, they're a quasi-judicial body that actually hears those cases. And I will tell you, it's a fun fact. If you think about kind of quasi-judicial and you think about judges and lawyers, and there are lawyers that are, that are there at those hearings, um, the kind of former um, chief judge of the Education Practices Commission is actually here um, in the room today. So very glad that, that she's here. Um, all of our work in educator quality is really guided by our goal, and Dr. Canopel referenced that uh, when he introduced me, is that every Florida teacher and leader is prepared, developed, supported, and supervised by educators who really make teaching better. That's really our goal as we think about our work in educator uh, quality. Um, I will tell you, as a former teacher, I was a former French teacher. Are there any former world language teachers? No world language, no Spanish. Wow, that's incredible. Um, I was a former uh, French teacher, and so you may have sat in a French class or a Spanish class, and one of the activities that we ask our students to engage in is translation. Did you have to do that when you were sitting in your Spanish, German, French class? And so uh, as a former French teacher, I always think about when you take this goal and you translate it, this is really how we talk about it each and every day, that we want every day in every classroom across the state of Florida, we want students to have the best teacher that's as good as any of the best teachers that we had when we were sitting in their, in, in their classrooms. So all of our work in educator quality really leads us to think about deeply around teaching and learning. And so today I want to share with you how all of this work really comes together as we think about transforming education, and in particular as we think about transforming 
teacher preparation. Notice I said I want us to think about transforming teacher preparation. Even though I said that, um, I will tell you the department, we're actually thinking deeply about both as we think about teacher preparation space. Those teachers need good leaders to support them. And so we're also thinking deeply about how we transform leader preparation. But today, I only have a limited amount of time. Dr. Canopel asked me to stay on time. So I'm gonna limit our focus today as we think about how we improve and transform teacher preparation. Uh, the research is clear. We know this research. Um, Dr. Knopel introduced so many of, of the faculty members on his team, and so part of his team, they're the ones completing the research. They're engaged in the research. So we know that's clear that teachers and leaders, they are the number one and number two factors that impact student learning in a school. They are the number one and number two reasons for student success in school. And so my challenge today for us during our time together is to think about how we transform and improve teacher preparation. Um, part, part of the reason that I think that this is such an important and fundamental concept that we must consider is because I think we have to start to think about what a 21st century teacher looks like. What, what does that actually look like? Um, I, I want us to take a step back and I always like to ground ourselves in facts and data and here is the reality, is that teaching has changed. It is absolutely changed. Um, you see there on the screen, this is a proud day for me when I finished my um, doctorate, and so my dad and my mom are, are flanking me uh, on the left and right. Um, I didn't put this picture up for you to just see a picture of my beautiful parents. Um, but teaching has changed. Teaching has changed since my father began teaching in 1964. Teaching looks different. They are retired, by the way, now my parents are. <laughs> Teaching has changed since my mother began teaching in 1966. Teaching has changed since I walked into the classroom in 1999. So to not only be a good teacher, but to really be a great teacher, and I want to define for you what I mean by great. I mean a great teacher is a teacher who can truly help make students gains and learning. And so if we realize the fact that teaching has changed, we must accept the fact that we, and let me define who we is, schools, school districts, colleges, universities, and yes, we at the Florida Department of Education, we must change also. We must begin to think about what a 21st century teacher looks like, and we have to think about how we will prepare them. As I think about this work, it makes me think of a quote from Dr. Maya Angelou. Dr. Maya Angelou says, when we know better, we do better. And so if you think about that last slide, since we know better, we know more now that teaching has changed, we must now do better. We must do better at all things teacher preparation from recruiting, preparing, developing, supporting, supervising teachers, we have to do better in that space in order to really make teaching better. Um, when I think about that notion and that concept, when I wrestle around changes that we need to make to teacher preparation, um, I tend to think of it in this way. Um, I frame my essential question. Some of you might be teachers in the room, and you remember when we were taught that we had to put our essential question on the board? And so I put my essential question on the board for you. How can we situate colleges, universities, schools, districts, and again, us also at the Florida Department of Education? How can we work collaboratively and in partnership to create the 21st century teacher? In my mind, that's the question that we need to continue to wrestle with. And so as I think about that preparation of teachers, I do want to ground us in some data. I will share, um, I will send Dr. Knopel and his um, staff uh, this deck. So um, I'm gonna go through some data slides. I'm going to go quickly, and I know you're out there. My data folks, where are my data folks out there? Some of you love data. And my professors, where are you? You're going to ask my methodology, you want to know about my conference intervals, all of that stuff. I'll tell you that afterwards, um, but I want to just go through a little bit of data as we ground ourselves in this notion and we wrestle with teacher preparation. Um, some of these slides 
uh, really share some difficult information for us, but I think it's important to, to realize where we are. Um, if we look at the current growth in student population in Florida, and listen, Florida's a great place to be. Um, we want great schools because we want our kids to stay here in Florida after they leave. So we have folks that are moving to Florida each and every day. Um, if to maintain the current student to teacher ratio, uh, we will need 8,500 full-time teachers over the six, next six years just to meet those demands. That can be a sobering number, 8,500 teachers we need, and that doesn't include if people retire. That number goes up as people retire, if they have a baby, they leave, so those numbers actually will increase. Now on this slide, um, I'm gonna just tell you the big highlights of each again. You'll have the deck, you can ask the methodology later. Um, but our teacher preparation uh, completions, the number of candidates leaving a teacher preparation program, and this is a traditional teacher preparation program, uh, oh, those numbers are on the decline. But isn't, and that's what the number represents on the blue line. On the green line, what you will see, that it's interesting fact, that's the number of teachers that are receiving their initial certification. So for my researchers, I know what your first question is. How does that make sense when you've got a decline with people graduating? Well, then where are they coming from? And so we can talk a little bit more about that. On the next slide, this slide shows you really uh, that not only are completers into teacher preparation programs numbers are declining, um, on the front end, uh, those candidates who are enrolled, students enrolling into teacher preparation programs, those are also down. Uh, we do see a downward spiral, a trend of those. Um, but our placement rates, like so after students graduate, that's pretty stable. That most you know, teachers are, are, most teachers are getting hired. This one again, a little bit, it's interesting piece here to look at, but we do continue to see a net increase in our classroom teacher workforce despite annual turnover. And so it's interesting data when you look at the turnover rate, uh, certainly spiked a little bit, has leveled off, but some interesting data um, points behind this that we can dig more deeply into. When we think about the notion of diversity, um, our teacher workforce in Florida is becoming more diverse, but it's still there is a gap. It certainly remains less diverse than our student population. Um, the research is actually coming out quite a bit on diversity and teachers uh, and students having teachers and school leaders that look like and resemble them. So certainly a point for us to think about when we think about diversity. Uh, these slides, you can just find your region just really quickly, the greater Tampa Bay region. You don't need to look at the whole map. But I just want to call your attention to what you'll see here are some of the numbers from our traditional teacher preparation programs. And it's, it's called an alternative pathway, our Educator Preparation Institute. But what we did was broke out those numbers by region, and the arrow means that we have seen a decline um, in the numbers in those regions. Again, I'm going to go through this quickly in the interest of time, but I will send this deck so that you can dig more deeply into this. And you can always invite me to your um, schools, your districts. I love to have conversations about this. I'll bring my team with me. Um, this uh, slide shows the number of completers from district certification programs. Um, if you um, graduate, I, I always make this up, let's say you graduate from USF with a degree in English, you want to be a teacher, you can actually, uh, you don't have the teaching background, you can roll into a district certification program and districts can help you receive those certificates. And so you can see again just by the numbers, the region, so we're tracking these numbers uh, very closely each year. And so while you may be sitting there wrestling with this data, there may be lots of questions going through your mind around the data. And so you may think, some of that was really hard to see, especially about the number of teachers that we're going to need. Uh, let me tell you that the, the way I approach this work is I really think about chapter four in this book, Good to Great. I know some of you read this book. How many of you read this book, Good to Great? Yeah, most people in the audience. Um, most people, when they think about chapter four, you've heard that statement, confront your brutal facts, confront your brutal reality. Um, chapter four, even though it's named confront your brutal facts, the second part of that is yet never lose faith. Yet never lose faith. He talks about the Stockdale paradox in that chapter. And so I think as we think about this work, as we think about these data around teacher preparation, they really present an opportunity for us to think about how we build partnerships to continue to improve and transform the landscape of teacher preparation. 
Um, as we talk about students at the department and post-secondary journey for students, we talk about on-ramps and off-ramps. And I think we need to, as we think about teacher preparation, uh, we need to be thinking about on-ramps and off-ramps for students. Um, I was visiting schools um, in counties on the East Coast, uh, the Northeast Coast of, of Florida, uh, last week. When I leave here, um, I'll be in some, some districts um, tomorrow. And I can tell you it's fun to visit districts and to see high quality instruction going on and to challenge schools to, to improve instruction. But I was really struck by, um, on the East Coast of Florida last week, I was in some schools and districts and I had a chance to visit some um, schools that are really focused on career pathways for students. There was a fire academy, a law academy, engineering academy. And while all of that work was great, um, I was struck by the fact that um, I think we missed the boat on talking about our own profession. And so as I think as I visit schools and districts, it's time that we elevate how important the work is of a teacher. Um, let's face it, for some Florida communities, schools are the economic engines. They are the economic drivers of that community. So as much time as we spend talking and preparing students for other professions, I also think it's time that we prepare students and talk about the importance of our own profession. Um, I'm scheduled, if my uh, schedule doesn't change, I'm scheduled to visit Pasco County Schools uh, tomorrow. I can tell you they have a teacher who's really um, has a, a teaching academy um, that's really dedicated to elevating and celebrating the, the profession and really talking deeply about our profession. And so these are the types of academies that we need to see um, across the state. So as we think about teacher preparation, we think about what a 21st century teacher looks like, um, I want you to start thinking about what skills, knowledge, competencies, dispositions that you think a 21st century teacher needs. Um, I can talk to you um, afterwards. I've got a list of what I think uh, that could look like, but I won't go on in the interest of time. Um, at the department, we're thinking deeply about policy, about how we support teacher preparation through partnerships, clinical experiences. I heard a professor's name mentioned around clinical experiences, recruitment, retention. We have a lot of work to do around teacher preparation. We're thankful to Governor Ron DeSantis um, as he's announced certainly a teacher compensation and teacher principal bonuses over the past uh, few weeks. And I really love this quote uh, from Governor DeSantis. He says, we want to make sure that we're doing all that we can to recruit and retain great educators throughout the state of Florida. Together, we can advance this and other proposals as we strive to make 2020 the year of the teacher. And so as we make 2020 the year of the teacher, we have to think about transforming teacher preparation. It will take an effort from all of us, schools, districts, our partners in the community, colleges, universities, and the Department of Education. And I can tell you I uh, love this work, I'm committed to this work, because here's what we know. Great, great teachers, great leaders, those equal great schools and great schools, certainly equal great communities that we live in. Um, I want to close with this quote from Dr. Annika Markholt. Um, this comes from a book of Leading Instructional Improvement. And I love this quote. Um, it says, we cannot stop at conversation. It's an essential vehicle of leadership that takes time to cultivate and sustain. But we should always keep our eyes on the prize, equity of outcomes for each and every student. So please let today's event not just be a conversation. Let's move past conversation and let's think about education in action as we think about transforming teacher preparation. Again, thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm gonna look forward to talking with you later today. Thank you, Dr. Burns. Um, you know, I think your comments were absolutely reflective of the spirit of, of um, our gathering today and, and very reflective of the conversation that you and I had. You know, regardless of how we approach this, we all want great schools. We want great teachers because, as Dr. Burns shared with us, great teachers, great leaders, Great administrators lead to great schools, and that leads to great communities. 
And so at this time, I want to introduce and bring three gentlemen to the stage who understand the importance of great schools to build great communities, who understand the importance of supporting teachers, supporting leaders, and supporting partnerships to build these great communities. Um, they'll be joining Dr. Burns and myself to take part in a conversation and reaction to the comments that we just had. This is meant to be an, an interactive conversation for you. And you'll see in a minute, we're, we're going to put a Slido poll up on the screen. If you've got a question that you would like to ask, that will pop up on my screen here. And um, we'll share that with our, with our panelists. So at this time, um, please join me in welcoming to the stage our panelists, Mr. Kurt Browning, Mr. Jeff Akins, and Dr. Michael Gregory. So as we contemplate university and district partnerships, as we think about how we work together as supporters of education, Dr. Burns alluded to the fact that there are a skill set that we'd like to see our teachers have. And so I'd, I'd like to ask a first question to our three panelists, and that is, what, what skills do you think are required for 21st century educators? And I don't know who wants to, to go first. But, you know, uh, we got three leaders up there. They're going to figure it out, right? Do you want to, yeah, I'll go first, and um, we'll probably go down the line then. Boy, this light is bright. I can't, I can't even see any of you. So one of the skills um, that I think we all face with, and, and, and perhaps we'll couch our comments, because all three of us um, gather periodically with all of the superintendents. And I think we will try our very hardest to um, to reflect and to represent not only the three of our feelings, but also superintendents as we wrestle with so many of these topics. But I want to thank Dr. Burns for his um, focus on transforming teacher preparation. And the thing we see as, as uh, filling the gap is, is really, as teachers exit the colleges of education, there's a, there's a gap in terms of the content knowledge. And, um, and that we need to collaborate and work together to s figure out how to close that gap. So when we have elementary teachers who have very little or a few courses in science and math and other things, so then they are expected to teach the Florida standards. As those standards are being revised, as was spoken about, the question would come about, so where is, how are, are you at the table of the University and College of Preparation programs? Are you at the table to formulate those standards? Are you at the table so that it impacts the teacher preparation program so that when young folks um, are enter the workforce, they're able to teach right then and there. Per perhaps no one's expecting tremendous proficiency right off the bat, but they understand the subject content. And collectively, and I know individually, we're spending millions and millions of dollars to fill that gap. And part of that is I see in the way the Florida teacher preparation programs are structured, is that they don't begin until their junior and senior year to really dive into some of these matters. And that the elementary mathematics or science and that progression doesn't really take hold. And I'm not speaking about methods courses, I'm speaking about the actual subject content so they feel comfortable to teach young people how to read and computate and understand science and vocabulary and do those types of things. I really believe that together we can restructure, or as, as was stated, transform colleges of education to be a true four-year preparatory program, as many other colleges do. And that is the second you walk in as a freshman to the time that you leave as a senior. We are preparing you. We're preparing you in your speech and your writing and your psychology, developmental psychology, child psychology. We're preparing you. Your electives are focused on what it is that you're going to be doing for the rest of your career. So when we talk about skills gap and we talk about those, those are the things that I see um, over the years that we need to work together so that we can fill those gaps and, and produce um, not only the numbers that Dr. Burns has put in, the numbers will always be with us. I'm more interested in the quality of the graduate across the, the bay because I, I continue to see that the 
quality of a teacher preparation program, nothing against alternative certifications. As you saw on the slide there, they're on the rise. But they, I will always prefer a four-year teacher preparation program because the quality is there. So, so in the 21st century, um, so teaching is, is a science, teaching standards, teaching curriculum, but it's just as much an art um, in our classrooms every single day. And, and what I see uh, teachers coming into our classrooms and, and teaching curriculum, they really first need to think about the teaching students. So understanding students, understanding their needs, and, and understanding how they're motivated and wired and, and how they can be truly um, be built with confidence to ultimately want to perform. So I, I think some of the things that, that our teachers are bringing uh, with them with regards to content knowledge is extremely important, just like Dr. Grego said. But ultimately, we want results from our students. And what we're seeing in our classrooms every single day is you're not going to get the results from the students until you have the relationship with the students you really understand what makes them tick. Uh, ultimately, you become an inspiration for them, and, and then, then ultimately they become owners uh, within their classrooms of that content and their success. And so to, to be an educator in the 21st century, to, to weave that into your content instruction is extremely important to ultimately get results. I will tell you, in Pasco, we have, yeah, give it up for Jeff. Uh, in Pasco, we have talked a great deal about how education is evolving. As a matter of fact, I just spoke with some students at Pine View Middle School yesterday and uh, talked about how and why we need to change what is happening in our classrooms um, because our kids have changed. And, and the way that we deliver education has got to change uh, in order to make sure that they're ready, uh, as I like to tell our kids, uh, to get out into a rough and tumble world. Uh, in Pasco, uh, we have um, developed over probably, what, four or five years ago, our common vision uh, of instructional excellence. And what it's done is kind of driven what, what uh, we expect our kids to know. Uh, and in this conversation, it's almost as what we expect our educators to know. Uh, how to communicate, how to set high expectations uh, for your students. Um, I'm sure most of you are aware of the recent TNTP study about the opportunity myth. Uh, if you have not seen that, if you've not read it, you need to get a copy of it. I will tell you the Pasco District has embraced it. We're pushing it. We're, we're driving those points home to our teachers because it changes what's happening in our classrooms. The days of sit and get uh, mm -hmm. are over. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we, we just can't have that in our classrooms if we expect to have the types of students uh, that our world today is actually demanding. So uh, Dr. Burns shared with us some um, important data on uh, the shortages that we're facing um, in schools. As, and as he noted, our population is growing, which is increasing the demand for educators. And at the same time, we have teachers that are retiring. So we know that there's a demand out there for students. There are, there are multiple pathways that, that we could go to uh, be certified to be a classroom teacher. But um, I think we're interested in hearing from the superintendents how that shortage has impacted you on the ground, in the classrooms, and, and maybe even some comments on the preparation level that you see based on the different pathways. Oh, my turn now? Thanks, Mike. <laughs> That's the hard question. I was waiting for you, you to say first. something. You usually you. do. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I will tell you, the, the teacher shortage, I, I kind of had my head in the sand for a while thinking, you know, this whole teacher shortage thing is really, it's just something else that's contrived. It's really, you know, we're having the teachers, but I will tell you, it is a reality. Um, every year uh, we go to start a school year, we have continually in Pasco brought our numbers down. I mean, I remember the first year I was superintendent, we ended up going into our first school year with like 460 vacancies into a school year. Um, this past year, I think we're down to 66. Uh, but that's not because of my efforts, it's because of the efforts of my team. Uh, one of the things that we've had to do is we've had to look at uh, the way, again, we had a diagnostic from TNTP back in 1314, and one of the things that they, that they showed to us was that we really need to change the way in which we hire teachers. 
we're waiting until March and April, which is really the wrong time to do it. You really need to start looking at it in, in August, September, the year before. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've revamped our entire uh, hiring process. We have uh, done more job fairs, uh, both instructional and non-instructional. Um, uh, we've looked at uh, just recently because of the shortage, we've had to bump up our sub salary um, and we've got a more systematic approach because subs don't work for free. Right. And uh, particularly when you live as close as I do to Hillsborough and Pinellas, uh, certainly resources are different and, and that puts a pressure on a district like Pasco uh, that we have to contend with. So it has had a significant impact on, on the way that, uh, that we staff our classrooms. Thank you, Kurt. So um, in Hillsborough, very well documented. I think um, the Tampa Bay Times did a very nice job last year uh, <laughs> covering you know, some of our challenges, but it, they were real. They were, they were real. So um, I had a conversation with our district leaders. I meet quarterly with all of our supervisors and, and directors across our district and really want to um, have them, even though they may not be having a footprint every day in, in our schools, at, in our classrooms, how a teacher vacancy at a school impacts their work. So I, I, I asked them, I said, is, last year, I said, Here, here's how that works. So today we have teacher vacancies across Hillsborough County. Because of that, the systems of support that we have put in place at our schools are breaking down. Coaches that should be supporting teachers, uh, resource staff, administrators who should be really doing the work that they have been prepared to do to support the great work in our classrooms, that system is breaking down in our schools. And because of that teacher vacancy and because of that a system of support breaking down, the district systems of support start to break down. You know, coaches and mentors that are really out there to do that work in supporting our schools are now having to go into classrooms and cover vacancies and do the, do the work that definitely is needed to make sure our, our students have the very best educators in front of them every day. And so everybody's work in our district shifts and changes and becomes more difficult, more complex when we have instructional vacancies in our classroom. So how do we uh, really address this to ensure that every single person along the pipeline, from student to teacher to leader at our buildings to all the staff in our district, can do the jobs in their space that they are assigned to do, and do them, uh, with great expertise and as they've been trained to do. The way you do that is you, you go back to the root cause, and the root cause was instructional vacancies in our classroom. So I'm very, very proud of our team and how they really brainstormed around this. We had a collaborative partner that came alongside of us in our district. Dr. Whalen from our HR officer is here today along with Ms. McManus and Mr. Peters. Uh, really thinking about the work of, of how we get out of our own way sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's some of the challenges that we face. Um, you know, as, as Kurt was talking about, some of the processes that were changed. We found that some of the things we were doing for decades just because, you know, those are the things that we had to look at and say, why are we doing that? Yep. We had to ask some very difficult questions. And, and, and in some spaces in districts, in large districts like ours, uh, they, those spaces become very sacred and those uh, decisions became very sacred. And, and the reasons why didn't really even make any sense anymore. Right. So changing our, our timeline, shifting the, the way that we do things and, and really listening to teachers, listening to leaders in our schools to, to kind of get out of our own way. This past year, that, that last year we had we hired 630 teachers last year. This year, going into this year, because we did a lot of that shifting and getting out of our own way, and we had a really great marketing and recruitment effort, we put in place uh, over almost 1,100 uh, teachers this year. Uh, we have our, our vacancies are down. And I must add to that, the way that those teachers go, are going to stay are great leaders in our schools. Right. So that's why when Dr. Burns was talking about teaching right. and leading, they go hand in hand. That's right. Let me approach it maybe a little bit different because uh, really the source of the problem was up on the screen before and that is the decreasing number of undergraduates going into the colleges of education. So we all have our strategies. We all recruit all year. We all in, across the state recruit throughout the United States. As you can see, the numbers, uh, be just the three of us probably hire close to 1,800 to 2,000 teachers. That is not getting all of the graduates from the University of South Florida, nor pretty much every single university in this state. So the question has to be, how can we work together so that the, the trajectory of the undergraduate enrollment starts to take a turn for, to go up? Uh, and it's not a single answer. And it's not one that uh, we're gonna just by, by placing, yes, the higher teacher salaries is, is one answer 
to that because it's going to be more reputable in terms of going into a profession of, of upper 40s, but also requires that the universities and the colleges, along with school districts, get out there and start to recruit and start to, to really take a more active role as you look at other districts, or not other districts, other colleges and universities. It is sometimes not only that we visit the schools, as Dr. Burns says, and his academies here and his academies here, where's the teaching academy? Mm -hmm. So we'll start academies, but those are also the agencies became very active in those school districts and to establish those academies. And they made those articulation agreements and they developed those bridges or those pathways so that more and more students were, were considering the um, universities and were considering the pathway of teaching as a profession. Those are the things we have to do so that the, the, the downward slope turns around. So we're here a year, um, we're here next year at this very luncheon and we're saying here's the enrollment at University of South Florida, it's going up. And that's what, what caused it, what's contributing to it, and how can we continue to work together to ensure that that happens. Thank you, Mike. So we've heard you talk about what's required for great teachers. They need to have content knowledge. They need to build important relationships with children. They need to have a vision of excellence and, and hold our kids to high expectations. As I'm scanning the questions that are coming up on the tablet here, there are, a lot of them are policy related, and the next question that we wanted to ask was about policies, but the folks in the, in the audience are asking about policies like teacher pay, the general knowledge test, working conditions, the deprofessionalization of the, the field of education. And so we have uh, someone from the Florida Department of Education who happens to know the commissioner and the governor. So <laughs> what, what kind of policies do you, um, superintendents that are down on the ground with, uh, with students and teachers and leaders every day, what kind of policies do you think will help um, to put the best quality teachers in your schools? Rec recognizing, as, as Mike just said, this is a systemic issue. There's not just one thing that will solve this problem. There's multiple interlocking issues that we need to consider. <clears throat> okay, so you want to yeah. superintendent's talk? I do. <laughs> okay, all right. So I'll kind of uh, start out here because uh, you know all those uh, questions you just you just mentioned are vitally important. Um, so I think we have to think about all the barriers right now that are preventing really great folks that are thinking about going into education to ultimately enter into that pipeline. You know I, I say over and over again I know where the great teachers are right now in the future of Hillsborough County. They're they're sitting in Hillsborough County High Schools right now. Absolutely. And that's where they that's where they are and. And if you, want to diverse, if you want to diversify the teaching workforce across Hillsborough County, you look at the high schools in Hillsborough County, they're all very diverse. And so how do we make sure across, you know, between that, that, that bridge between high school and, and post-secondary, that we build a bridge that provides any student that has that, that, that acumen for, for, for motivating and inspiring and learning content that they have that bridge built for them and they already, can, they already can have the hope built in them in high school to see themselves in that future classroom teaching. And, the, and so you have to really build from within, in my opinion, to, to solve this systemic issue around, around the numbers of, of people going or not going into education. Um, because I think, as Dr. Burns said, we have a lot of folks you know, um, in, in programs across our district to feed the workforce. And then we think, which is that workforce is, is by the way, the, the, the greatest number of employees in our communities are, are, are working in our school districts. We're the, we're the largest employers. <clears throat> so we have to think about ourselves in that work. Um, so th those are the things that I really think need to be thought of. Um, and I know that, um, that Paul is thinking in that direction. And how can we get one foot of our high school students already in those, those preparatory programs and then get them to the finish line? Thanks I want to jump in with, with that, and so I heard um, Dr. Knopel say, I mean, I'm not sure what the questions were around, but some of the topics around general knowledge tests or policy uh, implications around general knowledge tests or the policy implication around uh, teacher, teacher pay, and so I think Dr. Grego in really you know, said that it's a systemic issue. There are lots of, of pieces that, that go into really um, elevating and, and celebrating the, the teaching profession. Yes. Certainly one of them is about teacher pay. And I think seeing the, um, what the governor's proposed to increase um, teacher pay certainly is a, that's a big first step. 
um, he recently, last week, released um, about the bonus program, and so about some of the tiered work with our bonus program and supporting some of our students that are, that are most struggling and, and our schools that have the greatest need. And so I think that's certainly a part of it as well. I also think around the policy implications around um, general knowledge exam, I think that there are so much that we, uh, ways that we can support our students at our colleges and universities as we think about um, the general knowledge exam. Uh, there, that notion of innovation and partnerships I think is absolutely key as we think about some of these policy issues. I, I don't think from policy issues that us, um, and really, it's, you know, I'm sure this audience knows this certainly as the legislator passes and, you know, the, the, the laws, you know, part of certainly our role the department is, is implementing those laws. We're part of the, the executive branch with that. And so I think it's for us as we think about the implementation of that, I think it's work, working closely with our uh, superintendents, is working closely with our colleges of teachers of ed because that's where I think, I, I have recently coined this, this statement for, for me, I call it bridging TPP, theory, policy, and practice. And so I think it's really bridging that gap between all of those pieces together is what will help us with a systemic issue. Each, each year, um, one of the things I do is I have focus groups multiple with first year teachers in our district and it's just a room with usually about 30 at a time. And I ask a series of questions, but one of the questions I ask them beyond how is your onboarding and how can we get better, was if you had the opportunity to recommend something for your undergraduate program to improve upon or to, if you had an opportunity to reach back, no matter what universities they graduate from, what would you um, say to them? And, and without exception, the, the most frequent response is that I needed more content training to be proficient in the classroom. And with that, when we talk about classroom management, we talk about getting along and the relationships with, with, with individuals, and all of those things are built more easily upon the fact that the teacher is a content specialist because they're not struggling so much to teach that particular lesson. The ability to teach a youngster how to read or the ability to computate when the teacher is not, and I don't care what the grade level is, when the teacher is not comfortable with the content, other things start to fall apart. Right. And you could try to fix it in any which way you, you want. So, so, so in terms of policy, in terms of state exams, I for one, I might be in the minority, I'm not interested in lowering those standards to get more people in a door just because they, they are able to pass or not pass the general knowledge exam. This other question I ask these new teachers who come in there, I said, tell me about the general knowledge exam. And for, for most of them will say, I would question a teacher teaching if they couldn't pass the general knowledge exam. So I've never taken the general knowledge exam. I really don't know what it's about, but I trust in their, their site. And, and for, for, for the last focus meetings I had, this was a resounding answer. Let me just add that, that uh, I think when you cut through everything, when I've talked, I mean, the, the resounding issue over and over and over again is teacher pay. We've got to raise the teacher pay. I, I salute uh, Governor DeSantis for making the first stab at uh, doing something about moving that, that minimum pay up. Uh, Pasco has a district that struggled with trying to stay competitive in the Tampa Bay area. Um, and it just, it, it causes you to be creative uh, and think differently about how you're going to use revenues, uh, restricted revenues that you have available to you to do it. But I think that's the reason why we see the lower, in my, my own opinion, uh, is that that's the reason you see lower numbers coming into the colleges of education. Mm -hmm. How am I going to eat? How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to raise my family when I get my education degree? Um, and I think that's first and foremost. I know that we've had some discussions about the, the general knowledge test. I've got, a, I know a junior, maybe two juniors at River Ridge High School that have come out of the new teacher academy mm -hmm. and they already have the GKT passed. Yep. Already have it passed. They're, these kids are cocked and primed. They're ready to, to come to the universities and, and get their degrees. and, and and come back to Pasco County to teach. Right. Uh, and we're talking about dozens and dozens of kids every year that are leaving that academy. And we're in the process now of replicating that academy at other high schools because we know that we certainly, based on the numbers that Dr. Burns has showed us today, we can't keep up with the demand. So let's grow our own uh, and then we can teach in the Pasco way as well as the, the high expectations, the standards that we need 
and we set and we expect uh, in our classrooms. For our kids to be successful, absolutely. So I, I just have one more question and, and another common theme that I think you've heard from the speakers is that we need to do this together. And um, one of the things that I am, am very, very excited about and, and frankly proud of um, in the year and a half that I've been here at USF is we have worked very hard to renew and strengthen our partnerships with the surrounding districts to, to go and, and try and really listen and understand contextually what's going on and, and how we can be a partner. We, we understand that kids are going to come to the teaching profession in different ways. They might come directly from uh, high school. They may do a teacher academy. They may do a collegiate academy. Maybe they're going to go through a community college. Maybe they're going to do an alternate pathway and we um, are going to partner with the districts and help support those new teachers in place. So I, I'm interested and so are our, our audience. We're interested in hearing from you. So in your mind, how, how would a university district partnership evolve to meet these needs, not just of, of uh, staffing classrooms, but to bring students to proficiency? What would those district partnerships look like? And I think we've already heard some of it. From you. I, I do think that, um, and, and I, uh, my hat's off to, to you, Dean, uh, because uh, you have certainly engaged the Pasco District as well as the districts in the greater Tampa Bay area on how we can partner uh, more closely in order to uh, fill the gap, uh, to make sure that the teachers that the university, uh, the teachers that you're producing are in fact uh, the types of teachers that we want in our classrooms. Uh, I think that whole idea of uh, engaging in those uh, continued dialogues, discussions about what the expectations are of districts um, and uh, not lose sight of that and continue to refine that even more. Uh, I will tell you that uh, uh, even improving the pipeline for non-instructional staff yes. that want to come into uh, the, edu the instructional side, uh, either through a, a, a weekend or a night program. Uh, I think that's I think it's critical. I think you have uh, folks out there that that want to become teachers that would be great teachers uh, if there were programs set up outside the the traditional structure, if you will. Um, and then the other thing that we we talk a lot about is limiting the time uh, out of classroom for those teachers that are looking at the leadership track. Um, Jeff mentioned it, you know, when you have teacher absences and you have those teachers out of classrooms, uh, with all due respect to my substitutes, but that's a day of lost instruction. Right. Um, and it does upset, disrupt uh, the support structures that you do have in place. I think I want to answer that as well, to think about, you know, Dr. Rigo was really pushed to talk about content, and I will say, I think that is a big place to start with partnerships. It was, I, I won't out the teacher prep program it was my second month on the job a year and a half ago. And so much like schools are graded, you're familiar with the ABCDF grading for schools and districts, teacher preparation programs are also graded by us as well. And I can remember you know, being new in this role and being on my first site visit in a teacher preparation program. And I will say, I, I left with some, concern, with some concerns that day around the candidate that 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 college or university was going to graduate and what that person would actually be able to do in the classrooms. Um, so I think it's about clinical experiences, I think are a big part of this. I really think, and we've heard it today, it's an art and a science, but a part of that science is practice. I will, yes. I will own this, I will tell you, I'm happy to share with you afterwards, when I was a teacher, you know, I, I wasn't as good my first or second year. I just, I just, it took me some practice and working with some really highly effective and some high quality teachers that were able to, to, to coach me. We think about every, a lot of professions. I won't say every other. We think about professions and really that word profession. Like people get better at it the more you do it, right? It's Richard Elmore from Harvard says, you'll learn the work by doing the work. And so I think if we can build really high quality clinical experiences and partnerships with um, our, our high school students, our, our students that are in those first and second years, even before they you know, are in their internship or student teaching experiences, I just think of that as another strong way I think that we can support in partnership. Practice makes practice. And so I'll just echo those sentiments, because uh, we don't do anything alone in this profession. It's, it's got to be in collaboration. It's got to be side by side. And so I want to also um, thank you, Rob, for, um, for reaching out to superintendents and really listening 
and your staff listening. I know we have, we have some really great partnerships, and I think the way you, you form great partnerships is through that listening process. Listening. And really say, what, what is it that you're needing? What, what's the struggle that you're, you're, that you're uh, having in your district? And then when you're talking about getting more kids to proficiency, just like your question was really about, it's, it's about having great teachers in classrooms and, and making sure they are skilled. So the only way we can do that is, is to make sure that everything is very, very coherent, very, very aligned from the time stu uh, a student enters into the teacher prep program to, to the time they're in the classroom. So, you know, our urban teacher residency program that we have here in Hillsborough County, um, our turnaround leadership program uh, here for our leaders it, it, to build great leaders in our high need schools in Hillsborough County. Just coming alongside, I know that um, Ms. McManus has worked with the with the um, ed leadership uh, department and teacher prep programs to really help better align. Here's up, here's what our needs are, and you've been very responsive to that. And that that's what makes great partnerships, and that's what gets great results in our school district. So thank you. Thank you. So I'm absolutely huge supporter of the four year university teacher preparation model. I think as I sit and, and look out over this uh, audience, in terms of the University of South Florida, we have to continue to ask ourselves the question, if teaching has changed, mm -hmm. and if the four-year university model we, we so and I firmly believe in, how have we changed that model to, to meet the needs of the graduate? This is a supply and demand. This is a, this is a skill set that have we kept up with that? And if we haven't, the only way to do that, or if we have, is to partner with school districts as your recipient, as the recipient of your graduates, and to determine, the same way I do with focus groups, what are those gaps? And what are those gaps in our own system that we need to fill in? And what are those gaps at the teacher preparation level? I am very concerned about the various alternative certification programs that typically exist in um, secondary education. And I'm not opposed to them because they exist because of need, because we're not able to fill that gap. But I am concerned with the ease of which some folks may be issuing or as the numbers are going up in alternative certification what and how and to what degree, and I think there needs to be a whole lot more study in terms of their effectiveness. Uh, earning a certification and doing a really good job are two very different things. And um, my hesitation or my fear is that we do something, and we have in the past with the tremendous growth of the state of Florida, out of necessity, because we have to man those classrooms and, and do things like that. Um, our dean uh, has been tremendously responsive. I, I can say to you, I've, I've worked with several, and, and I can say that um, his, his reaching out, and so is the talent in this room. And if I'm the last one, if I could have a point of privilege, you know, this is the first year that Dr. Earl Leonard is not here. And I, I ask that you keep his family and him in your thoughts and prayers, because he is not only alumni of the University of South Florida, I know his, his thoughts run deep in many of the people in this room and uh, help create some of the careers that are in this room. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> so I, um, I want to thank our distinguished panel. Um, you honor us with your presence and, and um, I, I hope you know how much we value you, and I appreciate the, the kind things that you've said about the work of the college. Our, our listening has been deliberate, and we are your partner in this. Uh, you know, going back to Paul's comments, great communities require great schools, and we need great educators to staff them. So together, we're going to do this together, and so we appreciate you very, very much. Um, I did want to take an opportunity to share with you some of the things that we're doing in the College of Education, just really briefly to, to sort of show some of the innovation that's happening. Um, you know, and the first one really is renewed partnerships, and I will tell you very honestly, the program today was planned by the three superintendents that are here joining us on the panel. They helped us with this. This is a great example of us listening to them. We had a great breakfast in Brandon in June and sat down and said, hey, what do you want from this event? And they said, let's really talk about the challenges that we have in education and let's talk about what we're doing together with USF to, to, uh, to address that. 
But these renewed partnerships have allowed us to, in, uh, to engage in some thoughtful conversations around curriculum, just like you've heard right here. We have redesigned every single one of our MAT programs, and we're really kind of thinking about what are the skills that our kids need, what are the knowledge, skills, and dispositions, exactly what you heard the three superintendents talk about for 21st century teachers. But we're also thinking about innovative solutions around alternatively certified teachers. That is policy in the state. We want to make sure that there are great teachers in every single classroom, so we want to, just like we meet children and we meet them where they are and try to meet their needs, we want to meet teachers where they are and meet their needs because we want them to stay. Induction programs in education cost about $18,000 a year for each teacher. A revolving door of teachers is taxpayer dollars that don't lead to better instruction, and we need to address that. You know, we, I heard the comment of uh, building a bridge, which I was really excited to hear because one of, one of the other things that we've done to um, address the teacher shortage is to begin to build that bridge. We have worked very hard, especially with Pasco and Hillsboro, to think about a, a, a teacher pipeline and what does that look like and how do we identify children in high school that are in eighth or ninth grade that have an interest in education and can we have summer camps for them at USF to talk about what does a classroom of the future look like? How do we get them on our campus? How do we stay with them? How do we form these articulation agreements from high school that will allow them to transfer directly to USF and then these gentlemen are committed to giving them a job so you graduate from high school you go through this pathway and you have a job and that that is a huge advantage and we are excited about consolidation because the presence in st. Petersburg will also allow us to do that pipeline in Pinellas County and that's a critical partner of ours too so we're not forgetting about you Mike as we go through this we expect you to be part of that conversation as well you also heard um, conversations around practice practice makes practice makes better teachers and we know that sustained immersive experiences early on in that four-year degree program is what actually helps form better teachers we know that from the research we know that from watching that in the room and we hear that from our from our superintendent partners and so we've developed an office of field and clinical experiences in our college that as I said was led by uh, Dr. Sabella who has done an incredible job of even just continuing to build those conversations with, with our district partners about the experiences that they want kids to have, that we want kids to have, putting them in schools that have a culture of improvement. And that's really what makes great teachers. But even to use Kurt's word, right now they learn how this is done, how the work is done in the school districts. He, he said the Pasco way. So it's another way that we can help contribute to closing the gap and that shortage. We place them in great schools, they have a great experience with our district partners, and then you hire them, right? And so it's exactly the partnership that we want. Um, you know, the last thing that I wanted to share was, you know, that we know that um, schools are changing, right? Paul said that, right? They're, they're different. Schools in the 21st century are different. Creativity, innovation, and collaboration are principles that guide the work that we do in the College of Education at USF. And so today, I want to announce um, something that we're incredibly excited about. In January, we're going to open a new learning space in the College of Education that's called the Collaboratory for Innovation in Education. The collaboratory is managed by and led by Dr. James Welsh, I introduced him earlier in the program, and his team at the Florida Center for Instructional Technology. We imagine this to be a space for faculty, students, and our community partners to collaborate using the latest educational research, the latest technology, the latest practice, so we can immerse pre-service teachers, students in the College of Education, in-service teachers, even these high school students that we're hoping to bring on campus. It's gonna help our educators, both future and current teachers, learn hands-on teaching concepts, design thinking, arts-based inquiry, career and technical education, and, and so much more. By design, the technology available in the collaboratory will develop and change over time to support not only the research interests of our own faculty and student body, but also address the needs and challenges facing our partner schools in the Tampa Bay region. 
The space is going to host professional development workshops, summer camps, after school clubs, and any number of things. And so I wanted to show you a, a short video of the collaboratory so you can see the space. We are, as I said, just incredibly excited about it. And, and seeing the children in the space, you'll see how they really brought it to life when we invited them in a couple weeks back. We have flyers on the collaboratory for you at the registration table, so feel free to pick that up and read a little bit more about that space and share it with, with others. You know, I said to James and to his staff, I would be very unhappy if I walked past that room and saw it empty. We really want this to be an engaging collaborative space. We want children in the community in there. We want our students in there. We want teachers in there. So please, please share that information. We welcome any suggestions that you have about the way that we can use that. Um, I've got a couple things that I want to um, just announce before we say thank you and close for the day. Um, uh, what I was uh, reminded by Tracy was that there are some questions that we didn't get to, but we will um, try to answer those questions for you on social media. So if you don't follow us on social media, you'll see that we have a pretty, pretty robust presence. And so we'd be happy to address some of the comments and the questions that you had for us. Um, I also want to recognize uh, the communications team in the College of Education. I don't know if you've looked at our web page lately or saw the videos that are here, but we've really stepped up our game in um, sharing with the world the great work that happens in the College of Education at the University of South Florida. So they are in the back, Jordan and Josh and Elizabeth. <laughs> And I think, uh, I think lastly, um, we also have had some innovation and some change happening in the David C. Anshin Center um, for the advancement of uh, the profession of teaching uh, led by Dr. Hines. And we're starting a speaker series in, in the Anshin Center. Um, we've got two policy fellows and one scholar in residence. And tomorrow, actually, is the first um, in, our, in our annual speaker series. It's going to be uh, tomorrow evening in the College of Education. The topic will be supporting teacher emotional health, which was an incredibly timely topic. I don't know if you read Education Week, but those are the articles in Education Week right now is mental health challenges for teachers. Um, so the topic is supporting teacher emotional health, reducing stress, and improving well-being. And it's going to be led by our own Dr. Nate Vonderems, who's got a front row seat right here. He's going to be sharing um, some of his research and his insights from a series of studies that I think will be of great value to many of you. We have a reception planned in the rotunda in the college at 5 o'clock. And the speaker, uh, the presentation will, will uh, follow that immediately. And you're welcome to find more information about that at the registration table, but it's certainly on our web page as well. OK. Um, I have some parting gifts before we say goodbye and thank you. Um, first, I want to thank Cheryl Flood again. Um, she has just been an incredible partner and a, and a most gracious host on our event. And so we want to thank her for inviting us back to the, um, the Florida State Fairgrounds. Um, this is an event that we could not do without you, without you and, and without your team. And so you've been most gracious in, in welcoming us and feeding us. And so we want to thank you. A lot of you probably don't know this, but Cheryl is a UF alum. But we're working on, what's that? 
Nah, but she's, she's not wearing green, but she's not wearing orange and blue either. So we want to make sure that you've got some green. So if you would come up and join me. <laughs> She has taken USF classes, so there's a step in the That's right direction. Right. <laughs> now let's see, it says University of South Florida. Wait, we gotta do this way. Whoa, 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 whoa. gotta get the brand, gotta get the brand. <laughs> Are we ready? Yes. Go Bulls. That's right, there we go. And um, finally, it, it, Dr. Burns, you, you honored us with your presence, and we thank you for serving as our keynote for the event. I, I hope that everyone in the room in, enjoyed the presentation and, and Dr. Burns' insights into what a 21st century teacher looked like. So on behalf of the faculty and the staff of the USF College of Education, I want to give you an expression of our gratitude. some USF up in Tallahassee, so he'll have that, the bull up there in Tallahassee. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you to our superintendent panel, Jeff, Mike, and Kurt. We, we just can't tell you how much we appreciate you and everything that you do support the College of Education for our students, for our programs, and to be our partners as we, uh, as we work together to improve education in our great state. And thank you everyone for being with us today. We, we greatly appreciate you and we look forward to bringing you into the college and welcoming you to see the amazing things that are happening in our college. You're welcome anytime our doors are open. Thanks everybody for coming. Go Bulls.